I don't think you need any introduction, Mark, but you're now the United Nations Envoy for Climate Change. Is that the official title? That's the official special envoy. I'm not special. just an envoy, I'm a special envoy. So let me just start with my first question here. The question is, is how is GFAND, which you're leading, helping SMEs and companies actually transition to net zero? And how do we avoid those unintended consequences or penalties? Yeah, well, the first thing I, to say, uh, Anna, um, I mean, many respects, um, you're leading GFAND um, uh, because you, uh, Santander and you personally, one of the founders, and of course, uh, leading some of the most important work that GFANS is, because as you know, and others watching may not yet know, um, it's not just about commitments, but it's very much about action. And with that focus on clients, uh, the real economy. So I think th this question is exactly the right one to start with. Um, and th the second point to make is that uh, it's all too easy to talk about climate and transition at a macro level, at a country level, but not get down to the level of the SMEs and the individuals. And one of the core elements uh, that we can bring to the table for governments is to reflect back to them, for example, in the mortgage market, um, what is required uh, and what's required at, more broadly in terms of, uh, in terms of homes uh, and decarbonization of homes, retrofitting of homes, programs for those, what's working, what's not. And to the extent to which a financial institution, some of our colleagues in GFANS have very, very large mortgage books. You have quite a well, you have a large mortgage book, but you also have well diversified business, which is why you have 150 million uh, customers around the world. Um, but in essence, the ability with existing government policies to get to the climate goals is not there. Uh, and we can help show what else is required, how far we can work with customers, um, and then what else is required of governments. And one of the things which you have led um, and has just come out uh, last week uh, effectively is the call to action from GFANS, which makes very clear uh, the requirements of governments in terms of their policies and their clarity of their forward policies, particularly around SMEs. Now, there are other things we can do, and I'll just I'll flag one other, which is um, we all know that climate disclosure is very important. Uh, you, again, Santander, and you personally help lead that. It's now moving into becoming mandatory globally. But when we make it mandatory, it has to be proportionate for small and medium-sized enterprises. It has to be proportionate for emerging and developing economies. Um, and that's part of the work that we can help with. Uh, and in this case, and I'll finish here, uh, through the IFRS's new proposed International Sustainability Standards Board, which we'll plug in directly to make sure that as we move from concept to reality, it works on the ground. So if you had to pick, say, three policies related to finance that you think would make a transformational change, what would they be? Well, I think we start with the we start with the foundation of disclosure. And I, I mentioned it a moment ago, it, what's crucial now is to make it mandatory and global. There's a few processes to get there and the G20 uh, and, and broader governments need to finish the job uh, on that. I think the second thing is uh, to within a few years, not tomorrow, because the best practices are not there, but within two, three years to uh, set out requirements for companies to have net zero transition plans. And the third thing I'll say, again, in terms of finance, there's broader things governments absolutely need to do, but in terms of finance, uh, and again, this goes to um, your global footprint, uh, is to have much better ways of mobilizing private capital to emerging and developing economies. To me, are, are three transformative building blocks. Of course, there's more. Um, and last point, of course, it all links back into and is reinforced by credible and predictable government policy. We absolutely uh, believe everything you just said, and um, hopefully we can you know, together make a difference on, on that. Do you think that there is a danger of climate policy moving too fast with unintended consequences? Yeah. So the first thing is, and any time just away from climate, uh, and you're an expert as well in, in digitization and the digital transformation. So anytime we have uh, these big structural changes, they will have an impact on uh, not just uh, the underlying economy, but price the stability uh, on inflation. And of course, central banks need to take that into account and adjust policy. On a micro level, we don't have gas in the right place. We don't have the amounts of storage. Uh, the integration of global energy markets that's beginning, in part because of the transition, 
um, means that we need to build bigger buffers in our systems so we smooth the volatility. And you're absolutely right, Anna. This is a short-term inflation dynamic that is it's not exclusively related to the transition, but it is part of the story. The next point I'd make is that uh, the transition itself in the medium and longer term is disinflationary. So wind, solar, uh, uh, zero electric uh, vehicles, zero emission vehicles, sorry, um, all of those, the first two are already cheaper um, on the margin than fossil fuels. The, the, the third will become probably by the middle of this decade, certainly by the latter part. Um, so it will be disinflationary. The modeling for what it's worth, and it's worth something, of uh, the central banks through uh, the NGFS, as you've seen for climate stress tests, actually do show an uptick in inflation, a notable increase in inflation, you know, over the course of the next five years because of the transition. So uh, I think we need to be alert to that. Uh, and, you know, part of the answer is a smooth and anticipated transition, uh, but some of it will, will pass through to prices in the near term before we get the longer term benefits. Thank you. Um, so how important is carbon pricing, you know, actually having carbon markets to, be, uh, to, to get progress? Yeah, I think, well, I th very important. Uh, it's, there's, as you know, there's no silver bullet in climate change, uh, but uh, carbon pricing is uh, one of the most powerful uh, policies that can help uh, with adjustment. And particularly if a carbon price has a forward path to it, so relatively predictable forward uh, path and businesses can plan for that. Um, the, uh, we are making progress globally. It's been very slow, but now, uh, in part based on the example of uh, EU's ETS, um, Canada's carbon price that's come into place. Uh, we now see in countries like China, uh, which has their new ETS market, which as you know, has just started, is already twice the size of the EU's enormous market. So of course, everything in China is big, but that's a shift. Indonesia has just announced that they're going to move to a carbon pricing scheme uh, as well. So there is progress there. Um, but we need a lot more of it and it needs to move faster clearly is there are various ways to price the externality of carbon you can set a price but you can also have uh, forward policies on uh, blends of other fuels such as hydrogen or the moratoria that europe's putting in place on internal combustion engine vehicles that is a way to implicitly put a price on carbon but also drive the type of deep decarbonization and structural change in uh, in sectors of our economy. And governments need to pursue um, all of those policies in order, obviously, to accomplish our climate goals, but really to get the biggest benefit out of what we, you know, you and I and others have put together in GFANS, uh, this enormous amount of capital and expertise that wants to help with the transition now. How do we make faster progress on that global coordination so that the rules for the lending, for the investments, are consistent and are not creating all sorts of issues. Uh, you mentioned a few of those at the beginning, but just specifically on capital, and because at the end that's what's going to drive the you know the, the assets that are going to be uh, put on the balance sheet for the transition. So how should we think about that, and what can we do? What we need for that capital to flow to what's needed. I'm talking of different capital, not bank capital, but finance to flow to where it's needed is a consistent approach to what is a net zero asset? What is a transition asset? Because we've all committed, you've committed to uh, manage your balance sheet to net zero. Well, there are investments in lending in emerging economies that are consistent with that transition that could include a, a conversion of coal to uh, gas and then on to some other, uh, onto renewables. That we need, we need a framework so that, uh, that the authorities give, or not, we mark our own homework, but the authorities give um, so that uh, capital can flow to where it's needed. Um, again, that's something that um, through the mobilization, so-called mobilization work of GFANS, but just to go back to capital on it, I absolutely agree. We need a consistent approach, a global approach, um, and, um, and the authorities are only beginning to look at it at a global level. Um, so engagement on that is essential. Thank you so much. It's great. Uh that you were able to join us even virtually at this conference. And uh, I hope some other time you can come in person. And uh, I, I would love to come in person. I can't wait. <laughs> next, next year, we'll invite you. So everybody's listening to this. Thank you so much, Mark.
Thank you, Anna. Thank you.